儿啊。Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll continue where we left off yesterday in the book, Rome and Civil Liberty, by the Prince of Historians, James A. Wiley. And yesterday, James A. Wiley relayed to us a very consequential incident that occurred in Piedmont, a Roman Catholic portion of Italy and France. It was strictly Roman Catholics. All the Protestants had been routed out of the land with the cooperation of the Pope and the governments of Piedmont literally persecuted the Bible-believing Waldenses completely out of the country. And so now God is showing his hand of strength and pitting those governments that served the Pope in persecuting the Waldenses in pitting those governments and peoples against the Pope. And uh, the problem was that claiming papal supremacy and the primacy of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and that that church has its own system of discipline to discipline its priests, the priests were immune to the civil law you could not bring a charge against a criminal priest and you couldn't try him in a civil court because the church claims supremacy that the civil courts are not even qualified to level a charge against a priest as a matter of fact they're not even qualified to criticize a priest and also that uh, the churches of Piedmont the Roman Catholic churches of Piedmont seeing there were no more Protestant churches there at all the Roman Catholic Churches of Piedmont became refuges for criminals. Criminal priests and other criminals that claimed Roman Catholicism as their religion, if they committed a crime, they could seek refuge in these Roman Catholic churches, and the civil power couldn't pursue them, couldn't level a charge against them, and couldn't try them in a court of law, unless it was approved by the Pope in doing so. So the governments and the citizens of Piedmont were sick and tired of it. And they sought means to overthrow that supremacy of the papacy and to hold the priest to the same level of morality as the rest of the people. They were going to render blind justice just as much to the priests as to the people of Piedmont. And they were going to, they were going to declare no longer the sanctity of of the Roman Catholic churches as sanctuaries for the priests and sanctuaries for criminals. Now this pitted the government directly against one of the most prime concerns of the papacy. That is its supremacy. So what does papal supremacy mean? What does the primacy of the Pope mean? What does the the supremacy of the Roman Catholic Church really mean? I mean, we might hear that term used and never think a thing about it, but it is of great consequence to us to understand what papal primacy or the supremacy of the Pope really means. It's it's something that is not considered in this country, nor was it being considered in Great Britain at the time of the writing of this book when the papacy was setting up its own government and its own system of discipline in the dioceses of England. Uh, it was it was tantamount to a complete overthrow of the legitimate government. So James A. Wiley is now going to take his time and explain to us for our understanding what papal supremacy means. And it's critical for us in the United States today to understand what papal supremacy means. Now, after concluding his description of this battle this very, very consequential battle that raged between the civil governments of Piedmont 
and the churches and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church in, in Piedmont, James A. Wiley tells us on the bottom of page 141, he says, this is the old battle of the supremacy. Okay, he's talking about papal supremacy. And he says, it is strange that at this moment, when the idea of Rome claiming jurisdiction over temporal affairs and civil rulers is generally scouted, though only by those who don't know her, Rome herself should so openly and so audaciously advance that claim. That such was the claim involved in the Piedmontese quarrel appears undeniably from the following extract taken from the correspondence to which this matter has been given, has given rise between the courts of Turin and Rome. That courts of Turin being the civil courts of Piedmont and Rome. Which is interesting, he says, as being a recent deliverance of the Rome uh, of of the Roman See on the question on the on the famous question of supremacy. So we're going to see in this correspondence some understanding about what this papal supremacy really means. He says we pray our readers to mark well its import. Okay, James A. Wiley's giving you a heads up. Pay close attention, because this is very important. Here's the quote. Quote, he, being Cardinal Antonelli, Prime Minister of the Pope, briefly alludes to the concordats solemnly concluded with Piedmont. Okay? The papacy required the government of Piedmont to sign and adopt a concordat. And one of the primary elements of a concordat is to lay out the rights of the Roman Catholic Church and the rights of the Pope to govern his people in that country. Okay? The, the concordat, this legal binding document signed by both parties, the papacy and the civil government, guarantees the Pope certain rights. And uh, what, it ta what it is tantamount is to leaving open complete control of the papacy of that government. All right? But it is focused on the papal primacy, the papal supremacy. <clears throat> it guarantees the right of the pope to be the lord of his people. Okay? It's, a, it's, it's, it's on its face, on this very foundation is a challenge to the civil governments. The civil governments signing these concordats must concede if they wish to, to have the benefits of the concordat, they must concede papal primacy. That's ground floor of any concordat. Now, quote, he, being Cardinal Antonelli, briefly alludes to the concordats solemnly concluded with Piedmont and then proposes the question, quote, whether a state, that is a nation, particularly a Catholic one, in this case Piedmont, may on changing its political organization, that is changing its system of government, re uh, disregard the disciplinary rights of the church, that's your papal supremacy, without the consent of the Holy See. All right. The question is asked after once refer after very the first thing he did was refer to the concordat. Remember the concordat that you signed, you nation of Piedmont, you people, you civil governments of Piedmont. Remember the concordat that you signed with the papacy. Might be kind of handy right now if if you just reach down in your desk and grab a copy of that concordat and read it again real carefully is what the Pope's, what the Cardinal's trying to tell him. Now he says the question is whether a state, Piedmont, particularly a Roman Catholic state, Piedmont, may, on changing its political organization, disregard the disciplinary rights of the Church without the consent of the Holy See. Can you change your government? Look, it looks like you're changing your government in Piedmont, now, all of a sudden, you say the churches are no longer sacrosanct. 
and the civil power has now authority to come barging into the the church and arrest the priests and arrest the the uh, the criminals held re- uh, holding refuge there. That's a violation of your concordat. You're changing your 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 government, and you haven't done it with the with the consent of the Holy See. Right? You've signed a concordat. You're violating the concordat. The concordat stipulates that the priests are sacrosanct. They cannot be tried. They cannot be questioned. They cannot be charged by the civil government. They are immune to the civil government because they are supreme. They're much higher than the civil government. Likewise, his church is his sanctuary. You cannot violate the sanctity of his sanctuary. It belongs to the Pope. You signed a concordat. You agreed in order to benefit from the papacy in a Roman Catholic country, you must sign this concordat. And now you violated the concordat. I think I've made my point clear. All right? All right, the answer to that question He answers negatively, no, you may not change your government without consultation with the Holy See on the ground that the church is to be perfectly independent of the civil power as not having territorial limits. She is everywhere the sole arbiter of her discipline and being a divine institution, a true and perfect society, of a superior order to that of the civil societies. Okay? You cannot change your government. You cannot arrest the priests. You signed a concordat. You can't violate the sanctity of the church. You cannot cross the threshold of a Roman Catholic church because it enjoys the papal primacy. You agreed to it when you signed the concordat. And you signed it on the ground that you understood that the Roman Catholic Church is a perfect, perfectly independent entity as regards the civil power. Completely separate. The civil power has no jurisdiction whatsoever over the churches or the priests. And further, that the church has no territorial limits. In other words, you can't draw a line, a circle in your country and say, well, within this jurisdiction, we will obey the concordat, but outside that line, we will not obey the concordat. Okay? Okay? So the Roman Catholic Church has perfect, unlimited territorial limits. In other words, there are no limits. There are no limits. You may not break the concordat within your country. Nowhere may you break the concordat. And it says, she is everywhere the sole arbiter of her discipline. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church considers itself, and all baptized Roman Catholics are members of a a single nationality. A monarchy, a papal monarchy. They are first and foremost the citizens of Rome. Rome and Rome only has jurisdiction except in those places where Rome gives jurisdiction to the civil government. So at any time a Roman Catholic is arrested in a Roman Catholic country, it is up to the papacy to decide whether that Roman Catholic should be tried and, and dealt with under a Roman Catholic religious tribunal, an ecclesiastical tribunal, or whether the Holy See will delegate the discipline to the civil power. Okay, It's never the position of the state to do as it pleases in these cases. It must first seek the blessing of the Holy See with regard to questions of jurisdiction. See the primacy starting to take shape? where you can actually see what it means. All right. He says the church is perfectly independent from the civil power. It has no territorial limits, and she is everywhere the sole arbiter of her discipline. Anywhere Rome wishes to apply 
church discipline to one of her members, she is the sole arbiter. She doesn't have to consider, she doesn't have to consult the civil power in any matter regarding this disciplinary doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. The, the disciplinary jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church has no limits and it doesn't have to, cons uh, have to consult the civil power. Completely separate and immune. And it says, being a, and being by divine institution, there's claiming the papacy as the vicar of Christ, that the papacy is divinity, a true and perfect society. In other words, it's a true society, meaning it is visible, it is practical, it is all-encompassing, and it is all-sufficient. Therefore, it is a perfect society. Okay, if you have a perfect society, who can interfere in your affairs? You're, you're perfectly established to administer your own rules, your own laws, and to discipline violators of those laws, which the Roman Catholic Church, by Roman Catholic canon law, can do, then it is a perfect society. It needs no outside interference, is what it means. And it says also that it is a superior order to that of the civil societies. Okay? The civil powers are powers, in fact but they are not powers du jour, is what it literally means. The civil power has her concerns and jurisdictions as limited by the Pope, by the papacy, because it's superior. The papacy is superior. And uh, since the Roman Catholic Church is superior to the state, then it can do as it pleases without interference from the civil power. Now, if I have described that in terms that everyone can understand, what jurisdiction does this leave the civil government in any Roman Catholic country? Any? It's plainly made clear here that papal supremacy literally means that the civil power has no power whatsoever that is not derived from the Pope. And whatever power it has may be limited by the limitless church. You get to, you, if, you, if you really chew on this for a while, ruminate about it, the civil power is only for appearances. It's only there to do the bidding of the Pope. In actual fact, the civil powers literally just become a right arm of the Roman Catholic Church at this point. They're not independent of papal interference. And they're required under Roman Catholic canon law to be the servant of the church. You see how Rome kind of glosses over the true meaning of papal supremacy? Has anyone ever described to you what papal supremacy really means? In actual fact, the papacy considers all the governments of the world just serfs, servants of the church. They are just an instrument of her discipline should she decide to delegate that disciplinary power to the civil government. And if the civil government chooses to make laws on this or that area of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, concern, it's only, it only does so with the all-seeing eye, the papacy, over it. And at any time, the papacy can simply abrogate those laws, can just make them null and void. In a word, just one single word, the papacy can shut down the government. That's history. That has happened all throughout history. 
we've accounted many instances of this occurring over the years here at Inquisition Update. And this is literally what they were attempting to do in Great Britain with this so-called papal aggression, the dividing up of the land into uh, dioceses and appointing bishops over them. When England finally woke up to what was going on, they realized it was a hostile takeover of the government. By divine right. Okay? The government of England, the Queen and the Parliament, had no more than the weight of the of a feather compared to the titanic weight of the papacy. That's what England slowly but surely began to grasp. And that's obviously what was beginning to come to realization in Piedmont. And now it says now here no claim is advanced to an immediate and direct jurisdiction over temporal affairs and temporal rulers, but practically the jurisdiction asserted is tantamount to this. Okay? In other words, there's no overt language like I just used to describe what papal supremacy is. It's all very subtle. But James A. Wiley's telling you, if carefully considered and put in logical terms, trying not to conceal what it really is, the, the meaning of papal supremacy becomes starkly obvi obvious. Okay? He says, now, here, no claim is advanced in an immediate and direct jurisdiction over temporal affairs and temporal rulers. Okay? There's nothing that overtly just blurts out and says the civil government of Piedmont doesn't weigh the weight of a feather compared to the titanic weight of the papacy. No such words are used. But if you carefully read this and understand the language that is used, what it says is tantamount to this. The civil governments don't weigh the weight of a feather compared to the tantamount, the, the, the titanic weight of the papacy in jurisdiction and sovereignty and supremacy. Now he says three positions are laid down. First, that the authority of the Church of Rome, quote, has no territorial limits, unquote. That is, that the church's jurisdiction extends over all Christendom and beyond it. Okay? Now, if James A. Wiley was going to be perfectly descriptive, he would describe it the way I often describe it here on Inquisition Update. From the papacy's point of view, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. I am king of kings, lord of lords. No one may question the authority and supremacy and righteousness and divinity of the papacy. All civil governments, though they may serve the Pope, they may be destroyed at a word by the Pope. The Pope puts the crown on the king's head, and he, having done so, may remove it at will. Okay? That's how I would describe it in a land such as the United States of America that is so ignorant of Roman Catholic canon law and papal supremacy and the authority that the papacy has always claimed for itself. But James A. Wiley is much more subtle than I am. I just don't want my listeners to be misunderstood about, to, be, uh, uh, to uh, misunderstand what is really being said here. He says, first, that authority of the Church of Rome has no territorial limits. I would go even this far. The papacy wears a specific crown called the tiara. It's, a three, it's actually three crowns mounted on one frame. It's that beehive-looking hat, not the fish head hat, but the one that the papacy normally wears at the coronation of a pope. It, it signifies his territory. It has three crowns, one over heaven, one over earth, and one over purgatory or hell. And that's literally the territory and jurisdiction claimed by the papacy. It has no territorial limits. 
the Pope's power may not be constrained either in heaven or on earth or in hell. That's what it means. Now, do you have a clue what papal supremacy means? We'll continue right after these messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you value Inquisition Update and you are learning from it, please support Inquisition Update by supporting First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And if you'd like to email me, please do so. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Now, continuing, <clears throat> I described to you before the break what the territorial limits of the papacy is. There is none. <clears throat> Sounds absurd, doesn't it? Well, that's the absurdity of Antichrist. He claims no limit to his jurisdiction. No territorial limit to his jurisdiction. And no other limits to his jurisdiction. Now you might say, well, Tom, how does he put that into practice? You say he has authority over heaven and over hell. Certainly you've demonstrated over the years the Pope's temporal jurisdiction over how he exercises his temporal jurisdiction over the world and his control of the kings of the earth, the governments, and the laws that they write are in fact Roman Catholic canon law or they are no law at all. But how does he exercise his jurisdiction over heaven and hell? You haven't adequately explained that one to me, Tom. Well, look, Roman Catholic canon law clearly dictates that there is no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. If you're not a baptized member of the Roman Catholic Church, you are a heretic. And hell will be your permanent home. That is the long-standing doctrine and dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. There is no salvation outside the Church. So do you see how that imposes the Pope's jurisdiction over heaven? You can't go to heaven without the blessing of the Pope. You cannot enter the gates of heaven without the Pope's permission. Because outside that church there is no salvation. That's how the Pope practically exercises the authority that he claims to have over the very throne of Almighty God. Now you say, well, only the Antichrist would claim to have jurisdiction over heaven, God's throne. Well, duh. <laughs> Sorry to be so elementary, but he is the Antichrist. That's what, this is one of the things that distinguishes, positively identifies the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. He claims jurisdiction over God's throne. Now, who else have you ever heard? What flesh and blood man throughout all of history has ever been quoted as saying that he holds the keys to heaven and hell? Only Jesus, right? <laughs> well, this man in Rome claims that authority. He also claims no territorial limits, which includes God's heavenly throne. And who else besides man ever claimed authority over God's throne? Satan himself in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. Isn't that what he said? said it in his heart. Didn't dare say it out loud. He said it in his heart. He's a false prophet, okay? But he's doing everything he can to put all five of those I wills into practice in the world. And who did he pick to do this? The Pope of Rome. The Pope claims the same jurisdiction that Satan claimed for himself in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. Okay? 
Well, what did, what did God immediately answer in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 15? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Okay? This must be your prophecy. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. All five of your grandiose I wills. But yet you will be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. In other words, you're a false prophet. But nonetheless, the papacy, being the servant of Satan itself, has achieved in the world what Satan prophesied that he would do in Isaiah chapter 12, or 14. So this is the man of sin, the son of perdition. He claims no limit to his jurisdiction. He claims in Roman Catholic canon law in black and white that he claims the authority over heaven. And he says further, when the Pope speaks, it is God who speaks. Okay? That's Roman Catholic canon law. It's in black and white. The governments of the world adhere to it. When the Pope speaks, it is God that speaks. That's how, the, how, how he reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay? And he has, now you, Tom, you, you think at least you've demonstrated how the papacy puts into practice his claim and authority over the throne of God. What about hell? How does he exercise his jurisdiction over hell? Well, this was demonstrated during the time of the Protestant Reformation. In leading up to 1517, when the Protestant Reformation became officially recognized, the papacy set about all of Europe selling indulgences, okay? And if you've never heard the term before, it was just a term given to a piece of paper that if you gave so much money, then you could get out of purgatory. You could get out of hell. And then you could go to heaven. You see? The, 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 the indulgences demonstrates both the papacy's authority over hell and his papal, papal authority over heaven. Because in buying these indulgences, the papacy would take that receipt and file it in the Vatican. And for so much money, you just ka-ching, you got it, you got to... You know, hey, you could even buy, listen to this one, <clears throat> you could even buy an indulgence for the remission of a sin not yet committed. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, boy. So they took their money, they gave them to the priest, they got their paper indulgence, they put it in their pocket, and then they set about to kill somebody that they hated. All right? Maybe their wife <laughs> or their mistress or their competitor in business. And if hauled into the civil government for having committed a murder, all they had to do was pull out this indulgence and hand it to the judge. Now we go back to the papal primacy. If the Pope's signature is on, or, or one of his, the signature of one of his representatives selling these indulgences is, is pr apparent on this piece of paper, then the judge had to let you go free. That's how it worked. This is why Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformers rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the, the, the Pope finally put, laid on the straw that broke the Protestant back. The selling of indulgences, the get out of jail free, the get out of purgatory free ticket. That's what launched the Protestant Reformation. That pretense was just too much for those who once called themselves Catholics. They threw off the pretended authority of the Pope. They recognized that he wasn't the representative of Christ. He was the representative of Satan himself. And the more they read and studied the scriptures, they were absolutely confirming. They were confirmed in their hearts that they were right about the papacy. And together with the study of history, 
Roman Catholic canon law, all of it, the diabolical lives of the popes, the sinful character of the priests and the monks, and the debauchery of the nuns, the crimes of the Roman Catholic Church were too great a burden for them to bear anymore. And so they finally admitted what they wouldn't admit previously, that the papacy is the man of sin, son of perdition. He is that one prophesied in the Bible to come. He is not to come. He has already come. And the Protestant reformers realized that they'd served him their whole lives. And they repented, and they came out, and they started the Protestant Reformation. Okay? So the papal jurisdiction has no territorial limits. Not on the earth, not on heaven, and not in hell. And I've proven it to you in words that anyone can understand, a subject that anyone can research for themselves, and there's no excuse for you not to do it. I want my listeners to own this information. I want this knowledge to sink to the marrow of your bones. Listen, if you come to Inquisition Update and you just listen to Tom without doing your own research on these matters, then you leave yourself an opportunity that if push comes to shove and the pressure begins to rise, you can walk away from this knowledge and say, well, that's what Tom said. I don't really believe it. <clears throat> but if you research it yourself, you can't pass the buck. You can't put your head in the sand. You can't deny. But you have assurance that you know, that you know, that you know who Christ's enemy in the world is and how he has enslaved you. Listen, this is the very thing that the Protestant reformers experienced for themselves. They could no longer deny. You see, there have always been those all throughout history who said the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Well, for most of his life, Martin Luther could deny that. But after once seeing the evidence for himself, taking the time to research the scriptures and history, he came to that conclusion on his own. He owned it. And he could not deny it. He could not pass the buck. He became truly converted to Christ. And he became a warrior against Antichrist. That's what Protestantism is. You want to be a Protestant? Don't hide from this information. Make it your own. Listen to Inquisition Update. Use it for a guide. And then do your own research into these matters. Okay, what, what, what happens to a, a child if you just give them a car? Well, they tear it up, don't they? But if you make the child work for the car, he's more apt to take care of it. That's the same with this information. If you just sit there and receive this from me, you probably won't take as good a care of it as if you labored for yourself to get this information. I think I've made my point. Now, first, that the authority of the Church of Rome, quote, has no territorial limits. Not in heaven, not on earth, and not in hell. That is, that her jurisdiction extends over all Christendom and beyond it. James A. Wiley just simply failed to tell us how far beyond Christendom the Pope's jurisdiction extends. That's all the way to heaven and all the way to hell. Second, that quote, she is everywhere in the world the sole arbiter of her discipline, unquote. Which means that she claims the right of saying what causes affect the interests of religion. That is the Church of Rome. Okay? So the papacy 
the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, determines on its own what causes affect the Pope's jurisdiction. The civil power has no say in this. It, on any matter that could eventually affect the cause of religion, which literally is every matter, according to the papacy, then the papacy claims jurisdiction. So what's left for the civil power, I ask you once again? Nothing. It's just a paper tiger. All right? That's what the government of the United States represents to the papacy. Just a paper tiger. The Pope can wad it up and throw it in the, fi in the round file any time he wants. Okay? But it, if it's convenient, then the Pope lets it exist so long as it stays within its jurisdiction and nothing hinders the Roman Catholic cause of religion. All right? I hope I've described this. All right? She is everywhere the sole arbiter of her discipline, which means that she claims the right of saying what causes affect the interests of religion, that is, the Roman Catholic Church. All right? The interests of religion are confined to the Roman Catholic Church. And her interest is religion. No one else can claim to have any interest in religion because they're not religions. The Protestants can't claim jurisdiction over religious matters because they're not churches. They're not religious. They're heretics. Okay? Is this papal primacy beginning to take on flesh and bones so you can understand and see what it is? It's a monster. All right? Now, James A. Wiley continues. He says, there is no matter, no matter in the world which may not be made to appear to have a bearing more or less direct upon the interests of the church. And therefore, there's no matter over which the church may not claim jurisdiction. Okay? In this case, James A. Wiley uses clear language. There is no matter in the realm of human affairs that may not be made to affect religion, and therefore the papacy claims jurisdiction. You know, we used to have a law here in Iowa. You couldn't spit on the sidewalk. Well, let me just give you an extreme case of how the papacy might claim jurisdiction over somebody who spit on the sidewalk. If someone spits on the sidewalk and a priest walk, can walk by and slip on it and fall and break his hip, then that affects religion. And so, therefore... Tom comes under the jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church, and we will adjudicate his case. Okay, that's an extreme demonstration, but you can see what this amounts to. In practical speaking, if carefully understood, Roman Catholic canon law's jurisdiction is everywhere and always. There is no one exempt from Roman Catholic canon law and the church's dominion, the church's jurisdiction. That's how the papacy claims supremacy and primacy over all the governments of the world. And it's serious business. World wars are fought to preserve the, papal's prim the papal primacy. Oh, yes, I know, we, we're told that it's all about oil, or it's all about cheap labor, or it's all about territorial dominions, lines on a map. <laughs> Those are just convenient covers for religious papal crusades. There is no matter in human affairs that does not come under papal jurisdiction. Okay. 
all the wars are fought in the name of religion, ultimately. Even the current war. The so-called war on terror. Okay? Now, she may excommunicate any minister or prince. Um, and I could add the word pro uh, president or congressman or senator. She may excommunicate any minister or prince. She may abrogate laws, that is, do away with any law she pleases, or forbid their enactment. Okay? You ever hear of a law that's passed that's never enforced? <laughs> you never suspected the papacy had anything to do with that, did you? Well, <laughs> this is what James A. Wiley's insinuating. The papacy may abrogate any civil law, and it may forbid their enactment as we have seen her do in Piedmont, on the ground of which she is the sole judge, that these laws interfere with the interests of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, this is merely the temporal supremacy in another shape. Okay, remember the Pope claims spiritual supremacy and temporal supremacy. Now, what can you name in the world that doesn't fall under one of those two jurisdictions? Either the temporal, the worldly, and all human affairs, all earthly affairs, even the birds that sing, and the fish that swim, and the spiritual supremacy of the Pope. Yet there's did virtually no limit to the papacy's jurisdiction. You know, at that point, it becomes difficult to comprehend the arrogance, the blasphemy of the papacy. When this finally sinks in, then you can clearly understand if you're willing to admit what all this means, now you're ready to comprehend fully just what the papacy represents in the world. The Antichrist of the Bible. He says the third position is more subtle and not less dangerous than the preceding two. Namely, that the church, the Roman Catholic Church, and by that, uh, by extension, the papacy, is, quote, by divine institution, a true and perfect society of a superior order to that of the civil societies, unquote. He says, in a sense, this is true, but the design of asserting it here is not to vindicate the independence of the church or the pope, but to annihilate the independence of the state. Okay? This is Rome's way of telling you the state, the United States, the British state, the Irish state, the Bulgarian state, the African state, the Australian state, no state in the world has any independence from the church. No state has any independence. They all must answer to the Pope, which is just the triplicate repetition of what has been said previously. The papacy says it three times. There is no limit to the jurisdiction of the church. The state is the servant of the church, and the state has no authority given it but what is given to it by the Pope. That's Roman Catholic canon law. Now he says, it is not the doctrine of independent coordination, uh, uh, it is not the doctrine of independent coordinate jurisdiction which is here affirmed, but the dogma of uncontrolled, unlimited spiritual jurisdiction. Everyone who is familiar with the history 
of the supremacy knows that on this very plea, Rome raised herself to dominion over states and princes in former times. What were those former times? The Dark Ages, the Old World Order, when the Pope ruled supreme over the kings of the earth, and they did his bidding. Just as the governments of Piedmont did the bidding of the Pope, when the Pope ordered the extirpation and annihilation and extinction of the Waldenses held up in the, in the, in the, Aust in the uh, Swiss Alps and the French Alps and the Italian Alps. That's how far the papal dominion extends so far that it, that it makes slaves and crusaders out of the states for the Pope against God's people. That's what the old world order was. That's what the new world order is. Papal dominion and supremacy over every state to serve the Pope and to extirpate and annihilate Bible-believing Christians off of the planet. We'll continue with our reading tomorrow. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Inquisition Update.